I'm firmly convinced of this, that God gave us an awful lot of wonderful powers. God gave us the power to think. But we also choose whether we're going to succeed, whether we're going to fail. But we you also show me a great football coach, a great businessman. I'll show you somebody's had to overcome adversity. You remember one thing, that when we need love and understanding the most is when we really and truly probably deserve it the least. And if you just a had a tremendous animal. setback, what are you going to do now? Are you going to rally back from it or are you going to wallow in self-pity? You're going to have adversity in your industry. You're going to go through change the same as There's not a business and operation today that isn't in it except to help people get what they want. And as people's needs change, as society changes, business is going to change. All you're going to hear about are the problems. You're going to hear about the difficulties. You're going to hear about everything that's wrong, and the higher up you go in any organization, the more negative things you hear and the less praise you hear. You show me somebody that doesn't have a burning desire to go do something. I'll show you somebody that just wants to go through life day by day, expecting the worst and usually getting the worst. If you have somebody with a dream and a hope and an ambition, I'll show you somebody that's positive and somebody that good things happen. Call them up. Here we go. We're coming now. We got to come now. I'm sure many of you are sitting there saying, what in the world do I have in common with Lou Holtz, the football coach? Well, they do. ladies and gentlemen, we really have an awful lot in common. One thing we have is we have constant problems. I'd love to sit here and tell you about all the problems we have at the University of Notre Dame, but you're not really interested in those. Most people aren't interested in the problems we have, but the one thing I know is universal is you're going to have problems. be in this beautiful environment to realize that God gave us an awful lot of wonderful powers. He gave us the power to love, to think, to create, to imagine, to plan. The greatest power God gave us is the power to choose. We choose whether we're going to act or procrastinate, believe or doubt, pray or curse, help or heal, be happy or sad. We also choose whether we're going to succeed or fail. You're probably saying, well, then why doesn't everybody choose to succeed? The answer is very simply. People get discouraged when they have a little bit of adversity. You show me anybody that's ever achieved success, and I'll show you somebody that's had to get up off the ground in order to do it. We all have a tendency to look at people and say, boy, weren't they lucky. Didn't everything fall in the right place? But you and I both know that things don't work that way. Right here at this university, we've had some wonderful football coaches in the past. Newt Rockney, Frank Lee, the Air Force Legion, Dan Devine, all people that won the national championship. Now I'll show you, if you go back and look at their lives and study it, you'll find that all of them had to overcome adversity. I've had enough. I want to tell you that. And that's enough. That was not a catchable pass over there. I'll call an illegal use of the hands over there. Hey, yeah, after they changed it. Oh, that's what he called. I, I want the basic philosophy of any successful business is to help people get what they want. If you want to be successful, just find out what people desire and show them how you can help them get it better than anybody else can. The one thing we have to keep in mind is that people's needs change, and consequently, we must change to meet those needs. Take the top 50 businesses in America the last 50 years and compare them with the top 50 businesses today. You'll find there's been a tremendous change. Why? People's needs have changed. The business has not always changed to accommodate those needs. I know you're sitting there saying, well, Lou Holtz, what do you know about business? <laughs> I like to tell you a true story. I'll embellish it a little bit, but it's true. In 1963, I was assistant football coach at the College of William & Mary. It was a nine-month-a-year job, which meant three months out of the year I had to get a job in order to support my family. The job I got in 1963, ladies and gentlemen, was selling cemetery plots. 
And I don't know how tough your job is, but I want to tell you something. I ain't never had a tougher one. And my wife's usually very supportive of me. She said, you're going to do what? I said, I'm going to sell cemetery plots. Well, she became very negative. She said, you won't sell anything. Well, that summer, it's a matter of record. I sold our car, our stereo, our TV, our radio. <laughs> I sold virtually everything we've owned, but I've yet to sell a single cemetery plot. But all business is, all life is, is helping people get what they want. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been on top, and I've been on bottom, and I'll be both places again. When I was at Arkansas, we beat Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl, and they put me in the Hall of Fame, made a commemorative stamp honoring Lou Holtz, put my picture on the stamp. That was impressive. Next year, we had to do away with the stamp after Texas beat us. Uh, people kept spitting on the wrong side of it, you know. <laughs> I'm going to have at least three crises in my life in the next 12 months, and you are also. But I want to say this to you, and I believe it from the bottom of my heart. I've never had a crisis in my life that didn't make me stronger or make the organization better if we reacted positively to it. We can all grow and benefit from crises because they're going to happen in our life. And adversity is just another way to measure the greatness of an individual. You show me anybody that's ever done anything worthwhile, I'll show you somebody that's had to overcome adversity and I can give you a thousand examples. Next time you get down hard to remember the name of Jack Robertson. 1973 graduate of my alma mater, Kent State University, came within 800 yards of swimming the English Channel. You say, what's so great about that? Jack Robertson's a paraplegic. Does not have the use of any legs. I was invited to go to the New York Jets to be their head football coach in 1976. Ladies and gentlemen, I turned the job down three different times. I didn't think that's what I wanted to do. I finally said to my wife and family, well, let's go see what it's like. If it doesn't work out, we can always come back to intercollegiate athletics. I went up to the New York Jets hoping that everything worked out, but not a total commitment to it. I got up every morning saying, I'm not sure this is what I want to do. I'm not sure this is worth all the hassle. And it's a terrible way to go through life to get up every day and have to make that decision. And after signing a five-year contract with the New York Jets, I got up after eight months one morning and said, this isn't what I want to do, and I resigned. Now, nobody will ever understand the embarrassment and the ridicule that I experienced for several years after that. I went into a situation which should have been the happiest in the world. If you ever picked an ideal place to coach, everybody said it had been the New York Jets. I was called upon to go to the University of Minnesota. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have absolutely no desire to go to Minnesota. I'd never been in the state before. I don't like cold weather. And I noticed that every time I picked up the USA Today, Minnesota was always in dark blue. And everybody I'd ever met from Minnesota had blonde hair and blue ears, so I really wasn't real anxious to go up there. Now, they had a great guy up there, one of the greatest salesmen I've ever seen, a guy by the name of Harvey McKay. Harvey said, man, you ought to come up here to Minnesota. This is the greatest opportunity you could ever have. He said, you can recognize an opportunity. He said, there's potential there. I said, give me an example. He said, do you realize that last year Nebraska only beat us by 10? Well, I was impressed because Nebraska has a good program. I didn't know he meant 10 touchdowns. We lost 17 straight games. The average score was 47 to 13. Now, the program went down not because of a coach. The program went down because the whole attitude became, well, we aren't going to win anyway. Eighteen months later, we had the opportunity to go to a bowl game. Now, the program came back not because of a coach. The program came back because of the attitude. Attitude doesn't start at the bottom and work its way up. Attitude starts with you and me. You and I are going to set the tempo for everything that happens in an organization. What I'd want to tell you is this. You're special. I've been around this world a few times. There isn't a man in this room that I look at that I don't see great potential, great talent in a lot of areas. Don't focus on your shortcomings. Don't focus on the things you didn't do well. I want you to think about all the good things 
that you've done. And I would love to have you get up every morning and say, I am special. I can do some great things with my life. Yet 95% of the people in this world don't believe they have as much talent or ability as other people, and that's a shame. Why don't people believe in themselves? I find that I used to have a very poor self-image. If you find somebody that's negative, constantly complaining, constantly predicting doom, constantly tearing people down, I'll show you somebody that has a poor self-image and a belief in himself. I used to think, well, the reason I didn't have a lot of self-confidence was looks. Guy introduced me one time, said the best thing I can say about Lou Holtz is he isn't two-faced. And if he was, that sucker wouldn't be wearing the face he is today. It's, uh... <laughs> a team that wins is a team that does those things and is physical and plays together. And that's what this game's all about. It's not a game of individualism. It's 22 guys fighting, biting, scratching to move a 13-ounce pigskin across the alumni strike. And if you happen to be entrusted with that football in the kicking game, if you intercept it, if you're carrying it, if you're snapping it, man, without that thing, they're in the game, and hell, we throw it around like it's nothing. Not interested in looking in the back. Not interested in looking where we've been. I'm more interested in where we're going. I always felt that's why the good Lord put eyes in front of your head. Our goals for the season, of course, national championship, win a January 1 bowl, top 10, win a bowl game, winning season. I'm a firm believer in goals. Take a good look at me. You'll notice the following characteristics about Lou Holtz. I stand 5 feet 10, weigh 152 pounds, wear glasses, speak with the list, have a physique that appears like I've been inflicted with berry, berry, scurvy most of my life. I'm not going to impress anybody. The only reason I can stand up here as head football coach at the University of Notre Dame are two reasons. One, I have a great spouse. And two, as I'm very much goal-oriented. The only reason I can be head football coach at the University of Notre Dame was I have set some high goals. It all occurred in the year 1966 when I was hired by a young man by the name of Marvin Bass to go coach at the University of South Carolina. My wife was eight months pregnant with our third child. We spent every cent we had in the bank for a down payment on the home, and we went to South Carolina with great expectations. One month after there, Marvin Bass resigned to go to the Canadian League. And consequently, I was unemployed. At age 28, no money in the bank, unemployed, and your wife expecting her third child, that is a rather dismal point in my entire life. I don't think I've ever been any lower in my entire life than I was at that time. My wife has always been very supportive, but I'll always be deeply indebted to her because instead of complaining, she encouraged me. She even bought me a book. As I read about goal setting, he said, if you're bored with life, if you don't have a burning desire to get up and go do things in the morning, he said, the main problem is you don't have any goals. To really be accurate in goal setting, you need to take a piece of paper and pencil. Write down all the goals you wish to achieve. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I got out a pencil and paper. And I started writing down all the things I wished to do. I wanted to go to the White House for dinner. I wanted to be on the Tonight Show. I wanted to see the Pope. I wanted to go to the various continents. I wanted to win the national championship. I wanted to coach at Notre Dame. I wanted to be coach of the year. I wanted to make a hole in one. I wanted to do a lot of crazy things, jump out of an airplane, land on an aircraft carrier, go on a submarine. And next thing you know, I'm writing down those lists. I got 107 of them. And the more I wrote, the more excited I got. And I went to my wife and I said, honey, look at this. 107 of those suckers that we're going to do every one of them. She said, gee, that's nice. She said, why don't you add, get a job? So we made it 108. And I want to tell you, my whole life changed. I've taken over five college situations. William & Mary, NC State, 
Arkansas, Minnesota, Notre Dame. I've never inherited a winning football team. We've never failed to take that team to a bowl game by our second year at the latest. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a great football coach and I'm not a very smart individual. But I want to tell you this, the most important thing is getting people to believe in themselves. You get somebody to believe in themselves, they'll set bigger goals. Can you imagine walking up to Sir Edmund after he climbed Mount Everest and say, how'd you get here? And he said, I don't know, went for a walk and lo and behold, here I am. Things don't just happen. You have a goal, you have to believe that it's going to happen, you set a plan, you work for it, and you expect good things to happen. But always aim high. Hey, hey, no, yeah. Hey, Trey Lewis. So I've come to the conclusion that nobody ever again is going to make me feel inferior or unhappy without my permission. Hurry up, let's go. We were at the beach a couple of years ago, had on a bathing suit, and my wife looked at me, and she said, boy, you are skinny, aren't you? I said, honey, I'd like to remind you that it was minor defects like that that kept me from getting a better wife. You know, if I was bigger and stronger. Well, I don't think I'd make that same mistake again if presented with the opportunity. But, but it didn't look. Look doesn't have a thing to do with whether you're going to be positive and optimistic and help people and believe in yourself. Then I used to think the reason I didn't believe I could succeed was intelligence. I am not very smart. When I graduated from high school, I ranked 234 in a class of 278. Now, that didn't bother me, but it did upset me when the principal said it was a rather stupid class overall. And the guidance counselor wanted to know if I was going to work in a steel mill of the pottery. And I said, I'm going to go to Kent State University. He said, you don't have the academic background to succeed. He said, you'll flunk out. I said, you don't think I'm very smart, do you? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, Lou Holtz, a lot of people don't know what's going on. She said, but you don't even suspect anything's going on. And it's, <laughs> and it's true. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it isn't looks, and it isn't intelligence. I want to give you three simple little rules that we've used at every school I've ever coached to raise the self-image of people. The same three rules for I ha have for our children, the same three rules I have for myself, and I guarantee you these three rules are so simple I'm embarrassed to cover them. Do what's right, do the best you can, treat others you like to be treated. Whether you're involved in athletics or whether you're involved in life, we feel there's a very simple formula to enable you to reach your true potential. Do what's right, it's right to be honest. I can't begin to tell you that if we're going to have a society, it's got to be based on honesty. I'm going to tell you this, and everything you do, you've got to be fair to people. Anytime you treat one person different than the other, you are being unfair. And we can't afford to be unfair in our lives, and we can't afford to be unfair in this football team. I think whenever you have any doubt about the right and proper thing, just say, is this the right thing to do? Whenever you have a disagreement with somebody, ask yourself, is this the right thing to do? See, if we don't do what we know in our hearts the right and proper thing in life, then we're going to get a poor self-image of ourselves in our subconscious mind. The second rule is to do the very best you possibly can at all times and all ways. Not everybody can be All-American, All-Conference, or First Team, but everybody can be the best they're capable of being. I don't ask our athletes how many of them want to win. Everybody wants to win when the band's playing, the crowd's cheering, the TV lights are on. The question I ask is, can you live with losing? Can you live with failure? Can you live with mediocrity? I love what John F. Kennedy said in 1960. They asked him if he would accept the vice presidency of the United States because he's young and he's a Catholic. He said, no. He said, once you accept second place when first is available, you have a tendency to do it the rest of your life. Good job, Mickey Anderson. Good job. You love the game. You're durable. You're going to be outstanding. I am not going to accept anything June. less than the best somebody's capable of doing. When do we feel best about ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, when we went the extra mile? When we lay our head on the pillow late at night, tired, worn out, and exhausted. But we know we really paid the supreme price. No matter what the task is, 
Do it to the best of your ability and just as though you're going to put your name on it. Your name is very, very valuable. You got it from your father. Maybe it was all he had to give. But it's yours to use and cherish for as long as you may live. You may lose the what you gave you. It can always be replaced. But a black mark on your name, son, can never be erased. So guard it very closely, because after all said and done, you'll be glad the name is spotless when you give it to your son. Nobody controls our destiny but ourselves, and what we do and how we do it. What I want to see today is I want to see leadership, competitiveness, and I want to see you play with pressure. I had a kicker tell me one time, he said, Coach, I'm a good kicker, but I can't kick when you're looking. I said, well, you know, I plan on being in all the games. You've got to learn to play with pressure, and you've got to put the pressure on yourself here and what you do. We don't do our children a favor by allowing them to do the bare minimum. See, you can't be a great leader. You cannot be a great coach. You cannot be a great administrator. You cannot be a great parent if you don't have a strong faith in yourself. How can you tell when they're done? Because if you don't have a strong faith in yourself, you're going to want the approval of the people you're dealing with. No, 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 that's not too hard. What do we appreciate are the things we work for the most, the things we strive for. There is no way in this world you can be happy or you can achieve success if you aren't willing to work for things and to do it. We have a little motto here at the University of Notre Dame. That is, first we will be the best, and then we will be first. Everybody asks the question, are you committed to greatness? That's why we built this beautiful facility here, so that our athletes will know we really and truly want to be the very best. But I do know this, and what's important to us is to have a total commitment to being the very best we can be in all areas of our life. I've got to have athletes know that I genuinely care about them as people. Notre Dame's here to make it tough on you, to make it demanding on you, to make you special. The third rule is very simple. Treat other people as you like to be treated, sometimes referred to as a golden rule. I've never seen a business, a family, an organization, or a football team that cannot be changed around completely if you can generate love and feeling. In my high school banquet, they gave out a most valuable award. That was the most important thing in the world to me at that time. And I went to that high school banquet with all the anticipation of winning it. And they said the most valuable player is, and before they called my name, I stood up, and they said the most valuable player is Jack Doty. Well, that was rather embarrassing because I was already on my feet, so I immediately led a standing ovation for Jack Doty with tears running down my cheeks. The speaker was a guy named Eddie Finnegan from Western Reserve, and I only remember one thing he said. He said, take the opportunity to let people know you appreciate them before it's too late. Unfortunately, we don't do this very, very often. Nice job, Mickey. I also think it's exceptionally important that you tell your parents you love them and you appreciate them. And I really wish you would put it down in the letter again before you go. We've talked about this before. You have no idea the impact that you can have on other people. The letter you write your mom and dad, I'll tell you this right now, they'll read it at least 10 different times. They'll sit there and they'll read that thing over and over and put out your heart on it. The best way I know to generate love and feeling among a group of people is to get them to treat others as they would like to be treated. You know, the basis of teamwork is love and feeling. Teamwork is a foundation for success and excellence. You cannot have excellence unless you have great togetherness. You can take a hand with five fingers going in five different directions, and that's not very powerful. But if you bring all those fingers together for one common cause and a closeness, you form a very powerful fist. Oh! Way to go, Winnie. Great shot. I tell your problem. Uh, tell if we treat other people as we would like to be treated, all of a sudden we find that the love, the feeling, the kindness, and the extra effort all goes together. As we treat other people as we'd like to be treated and go out of our way to do special things for them, not because we're going to benefit individually, but because we really and truly want to help people. That's not bad, was it? If you I'll guarantee our self-image will rise and the love and the feeling and the growing and the positiveness will permeate your organization like nothing you've ever seen. Okay. Have a good time. And you'll have a tendency to say, how did this all happen?
These three rules guarantee success, whether we're talking about a football team, a family, or an organization. Why do these three rules guarantee success? Because there are three universal questions that everybody asks of one another. Every parent of every child, every child of every parent, every player of every coach, every coach of every player, etc. The three universal questions that everybody asks about one another subconsciously are, can I trust you? Are you committed? Do you care about me? My wife and I have been married together this summer, 54 years, 27 apiece. <laughs> but the only reason we can be married 27 years together is she must be able to trust me, I must be able to trust her. If we can't trust one another, there's no way in this world we can remain married. Athletes must trust me. But I've got to have athletes I can trust as well. If they can't trust me or I can't trust them, we don't have a chance. And any time you deal with the public, you must have the trust of the public. Because without it, you don't have a chance. The second question everybody asks, are you committed to excellence? Everybody wants to be identified with people that aspire to be the very best. Maybe not the very biggest, but certainly to be the very best they possibly can be. I don't think our players can hear enough how fortunate they are to be at this school, and I feel the same as coaches. I think that selling unselfishness, selling winning, selling total team concept, if you preach something long enough, I'm going to tell you, they're going to believe it, particularly in our case where it's true. The games that are always the best is when you have a group of people that absolutely refuse to lose. In every football game, you have a winner and a loser, but on every play, you have 11 winners and 11 losers. Life's a personal battle in everything you do. Every play, either you won or you lost in comparison with the guy next to you. But I expect to see one great football game, and I expect to see the greatest leadership from our upperclassmen and the most spirit and enthusiasm that goes with being at Notre Dame and what's on that headgear. And the third question everybody asks is probably the most important question, that is, do you care about me? Do you really and truly care about me, or do you care about me because I can run or throw or catch? Do you care about me as a person? You're a great group. I want to tell you this. I appreciate you. I have great respect for you. I also have great optimism for this football team. Appreciate them. Call them up. Let's get out of here. And you aren't going to build a successful team, a successful family, or a successful life overnight. I have great respect for you people because of the effort it takes on a daily basis. The poem, it says, I saw a group of men in my hometown. I saw a group of men tearing a building down. With a heave and a hoe and a mighty yell, they swung a beam and the sidewall fell. I said, I said to the former, former are these men skilled? The, the type you'd hire if you wanted to build. And he laughed and said, why no, indeed. He said, common labor is all I need. Right, right tear, tear down, down the deer, too, too, what it took a builder 10 years to do. And I thought to myself as I walked away, which of these which roles, of these roles am I going to play? Am I the type that constantly tears down as I make my way foolishly around? Or am I the type that's trying to build with care in hopes that my community, family, or organization will be glad that I was there? I'd like to leave you with a true story that happened several years ago that illustrates these three things. I'd gone to the University of Arkansas, and we were getting ready to play Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl. We had a very fine football team, had a very successful year. We had those three rules, do what's right, do the best you can, treat others you like to be treated. And unfortunately, I was called upon to keep three young men from participating in the football game because they had violated a rule we had, and it was a serious rule. We went down to play Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl, and I want to tell you, nobody gave us a chance to win the game. We were a 24-point underdog, and every time you picked up the newspaper, it talked about the great athletes from Oklahoma. Never once did it talk about a good athlete from Arkansas. 
They said about how bad we were and how bad we would get beat. And you know what? They talked about we were, didn't have a chance in the world. And our football team believed it. And they started acting that way. I had a meeting two days before the football game in the Four Seasons Hotel. As the athletes came in, it was the quietest group you'd ever seen. I never did this trick before publicly. But I said, you know, this is like any other newspaper. You have front page for people who want to read the news. You have the comics for people who can't read. You have the editorial page for people who can't think. I said, you know, it's really amazing. You're going to roll over and die because you read your obituary in the newspaper. I said, you really have to have a faith and you have to have a belief. If there's one thing in this world I wish I could get across to everybody in this world, don't let people tear you down. Don't let people cause you to lose faith and confidence in yourself and in what you're doing. If you believe in yourself, it's so easy to lift other people up. I said, you know, we really can win this football game if you really have a strong faith and you have a belief. If you're going to believe that somebody can tear you up and you can't put yourself back together, you're in real problem. Now, I said, I'm going to tell you what, we're going to go around this room and I want you to tell me why we can win. And I suggest to you here today, sometime you sit down and list all the positive things about you. But I said, I want to know why we can win. Surely there's something that we have going for us. As they started thinking about it, they got up one by one because we weren't leaving that room till they started telling me why we could win. They got up, I said, I want it to be positive and I want it to be sincere. They said, well, you know, we do have the number one defense in the country statistically, which we did, and it was intact. And if we are going to lose, we aren't going to get beat bad because they aren't going to score a lot. And I'm going to tell you what, is the more they talked about one another and looked at why they could win, you could see the whole attitude change. They trusted one another. They were brought together. But they made a commitment to one another that evening before they left there. Win, lose, or draw, they were going to be the best they could be. And you could tell that they cared about one another when they started praising one another. Boy, I tell you, it's amazing what happens when you look for something sincere to say positive about somebody. Ladies and gentlemen, when that football team left that room that day, they were a different team. The news media stopped coming to practice by that time. The next day, we had an unbelievable practice. And in our locker room before the game, you could feel the trust, the love, the commitment all came together. You could feel it. I didn't know if we'd win, but I knew this. We were going to be outstanding because the attitude was there. Now, I've had people say to me, I knew you'd win that game the way your team came out that locker room door. They said, I've never seen a team that fired up. What'd you tell them? I said, Oklahoma's big, mean, strong, nasty, and aggressive. I said, the last 11 of you out of here are going to have to start. Boy, tore that door down to get out. We won the football game 31 to 6. And a tremendous upset, and it wasn't coaching. Okay. A prime example okay. of trust, commitment, and love. So the philosophy is very simple. God gave us a lot of powers, but it's our power to choose whether we succeed or fail. If we choose to succeed, we've got to realize we're going to have to overcome adversity. The basic philosophy of any business is to help people get what they want. If you help enough people get what they want, you'll get anything in this world you want, which constitutes a goal. A good, healthy self-image is not caused by looks or by intelligence. A good self-image is caused by doing three simple little things. Rule number one, do what's right. Rule number two, do the best you can. Rule number three, treat others you like to be treated. Because those three rules answer the three universal questions everybody asks. Question number one, can I trust you? Question number two, are you committed to excellence? Question number three, you care about me as a person. As Oliver Wendell Holmes said, what lies behind us and what lies ahead of us is of very little importance when it's compared to what lies within us. If trust, commitment, and love lie within any organization, I promise you it will be successful. Wake up, 
we have a most difficult schedule. Somebody said, how do you sleep with a schedule like that? I said, like a baby. Wake up every two hours and cry. Tremendous, even though they got us a timeout. Great game, wasn't it?